presenting today uh, XRP Ledger Proof of Payment, or XPOP, uh, which is a pretty pretty cool little bit of tech we wrote. And uh, it uh, solves a very specific problem. So let's uh, go straight to slide two. OK, so the problem is uh, there's uh, 15 million vending machines in the world and untold parking meters and Internet of Things devices and so on and so forth. And most of them don't have a connection to the internet. So wouldn't it be really nice if we could pay for something via the XRP ledger and then prove that we paid for it to an offline device? So that's the basic crux of the, uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. So we need to prove a payment was successfully made without both sides being connected to the internet. We know that uh, users, customers have mobile devices, and they, uh, generally speaking, are well connected to the internet these days. But the other side uh, may not be. So the solution we came up with is uh, based on the way the structure of the XRP ledger uh, itself. So on the XRP ledger, you have validators. Validators sign validation messages. Validation messages contain a ledger header. The ledger header contains a transaction root. Transaction root is the root of a Merkle tree. And the Merkle tree contains, ultimately, the transaction blob and the metadata, which confirms that the transaction was successfully executed. And for example, how many drops were delivered or any other information about the transaction that isn't the transaction itself. So with this chain of trust that, we've, uh, that we're exploiting here, you are effectively trusting that the XRP Ledger Foundation will not sign a validator list containing validators who will conspire to defraud specifically you. So that's the additional uh, trust that you have. Other than that, uh, it's, uh, the, the trust requirements are, are minimal because you, you have uh, public key signatures and uh, cryptographically secure hashes all the way down. Next slide, please. So the problem with uh, this uh, chain of trust is proving that uh, all of that happened, uh, proving that chain from end to end ends up being quite a lot of data. We uh, have uh, the full validator list needs to be included in, with the signatures. The validation messages for the ledger that the transaction ended up in needs to be uh, included. And those validation messages can be quite large if it was a voting ledger. Uh, the ledger header needs to be included. The Merkle proof, so from the transaction route down the Merkle tree uh, all the way down to the transaction itself, which also needs to be included, and the metadata for the transaction. And uh, when we sum all of that up, it's about 50 kilobytes. And I'll ask uh, Vitsa now to just go to LiveNet and pick a random transaction, and we can show exactly how much data that we're talking about that we need to transfer to the offline device. Yeah, so if you uh, scroll down here, this is the full validator list. It has all the validation messages. It has the ledger header. It has the Merkle proof. It has the transaction and the metadata all for a specific just random transaction that we picked off LiveNet there. So how, how do we transfer this? We've got the, uh, the way that we want to do the chain of proof, but uh, how on earth do we transfer it to an offline device? That's, the, that's an engineering problem in and of itself, quite a difficult one. So next slide, please. OK, cool. Yeah, so our, the solution that we came up with is animating QR codes, which uh, look kind of funky, but they also look kind of cool. And what we ended up doing is we uh, first broadly compressed our JSON, and then we uh, base58 encoded it so that we could use the text mode of QR codes. And then we split it into multiple QR codes, and we added some uh, parity frames. And then we generated as an animated GIF. And then we display the GIF. And this actually turns out to be quite robust. And uh, so you can display this on your phone and uh, cause the vending machine to receive that uh, entire 50 kilobyte payload in about uh, 10, 10 to 15 seconds, uh, fairly reliably. And then uh, it can uh, verify for itself that the, uh, the proof is correct, and then uh, vend, uh, vend your goods. Next slide, please. So why animating QR codes? Well, cameras are cheap. Cameras require no licenses, unlike uh, potentially like a radio frequency solution. Uh, phone screens are high definition these days, so uh, we can have a, a quite a, a dense uh, uh, QR field. There, uh, QR codes are familiar to users, so it's not like we're asking them to do something that's really strange and unfamiliar. They're just uh, loading up a, QR, a funky looking QR code and displaying it back to the vending machine. It works even in noisy and crowded environments. So to work at a conference or a, a, a show or whatever. And it also works in electrically noisy environments because uh, as long as you can transmit light, uh, it'll work. Next slide, please. 
So we, uh, we did face some problems in designing this. Uh, the refresh rate between the camera, so how often the camera takes a, an image, and uh, the screen that you're viewing, so in this case your phone screen, uh, they, they never match up. No, the, the chances of them matching up are almost zero. And the problem is, you might have seen this way back in the day when people used to film uh, CRT screens, as shown in this picture here of this bowling screen. The, uh, the rolling black bars. So this is where the, the frame doesn't match between the, the image that's captured on the camera and the image that's uh, being displayed uh, on, the, on the screen. They, so for example, the camera might catch at uh, 60 frames a second and the screen might display at 24 frames a second. And those will always be out of sync and you're always gonna lose some frames. So in the end, we uh, decided uh, we would add uh, parity frames quite aggressively so that the camera only needs any three out of each four frames to successfully decode. And the parity frames work even a little bit better than that because you can, uh, if you've got a lot of uh, frames from early on, then you can, you can use some of the parity frames later on. Uh, anyway, you, we, we will show you, uh, we will link the code and you can have a look at it if you're interested. Next slide, please. So there are some possible uh, attack vectors for this uh, XPOP solution. Uh, the main one is a replay attack. So how does the machine know if uh, you haven't already displayed this XPOP to, for example, another vending machine right beside it to prove that you already bought, you bought a Coke and then this, this second vending machine also dispenses a Coke. But it's easily mitigated. You just uh, place a, a random nonce into the, uh, the payment request that the, the user is actually responding to. So the user will scan a QR code off the vending machine. They'll pay to that QR code and then they'll generate the XPOP and they'll display the XPOP back to the vending machine. And as long as that uh, random nonce is always different, which is, is very easy to do, then the, the, um, the possibility of replay attacks is down to the collision between the nonces, which is uh, astronomically small. So, uh, Next slide, please. So there are some additional issues. Obviously, the uh, animated QR is only a one-way transfer. The vending device uh, needs a timeout, so it can't just wait forever for the user to display the, uh, the animating QR code. And it's possible that the user ends up paying and the nonce uh, times out, and then they won't, they just won't get their uh, purchase. However, these are all the same problems that are currently faced by uh, vending machines. You put your coins in and it doesn't vend, or the little spiral thing comes out only halfway or, or whatever. And uh, you know, this is why vending machines have phone numbers on the side, so uh, we don't actually see this as a big, big deal. Okay, it's demo time. So this is what you've been waiting for. Vitz is going to uh, make a payment. He's going to scan the QR code on his uh, little vending machine there. So he's just uh, setting it up with a random nonce. And there's the QR code to scan to make the payment. There he is, scanning in some. And now he's going to make the payment on the XFP ledger. Now this vending machine is offline. It doesn't have uh, internet connectivity. Yeah, okay. So the payment's gone through successfully. Now he's going to uh, load up the XPOP for that payment. So you can load an XPOP for any payment or any transaction type on the XFP ledger. Okay, now it's displaying it to the uh, vending machine and it should read the frames, probably decode some parity frames. And I, I assume it's vending. <laughs> supporting. I can't hear you, I'm sorry guys. So interestingly, I have a, just a couple more comments on it. Uh, interestingly enough, this can actually be used with any XFP ledger transaction type. And because it includes the metadata, you could even use it with a hook. So after a hook's finished executing, it uh, has a return code and a return string that's stored in the metadata on the XFP ledger. And that would actually end up inside the uh, XPOP. And so you could actually do uh, a complete vending machine management inside the state of a hook and have, uh, uh, basically, the transaction accepted or rejected based on your 
your known inventory, which is stored on the ledger inside the hook state. And then the machine would uh, vend based on the, the metadata and the result of the transaction. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool piece of tech. OK, that's, that's the end of my talk. Any question? Yes? Where? Er, let me. Sorry, one question I have. You have to keep track of everything that was approved in the machine, right? Um, like the history of uh, how to avoid the double cell in the same machine. Uh, how much memory do you need in that machine, like space-wise? How much uh, I, storage I, do you need? I don't think you need any, actually, because... So, I mean, the machine has its own inventory that it already presumably uses to keep track of what things are sold out and what aren't. And for assume, assuming that you're buying something that isn't sold out in the machine, the machine just picks a random number as the nonce and then displays the QR code to you. Yeah, so to answer your question, uh, no persistent storage is required in the device at all. It uh, works the same way a coin receiver works in, in any vending machine. So. The vending machine already knows how much it wants to charge you and if the item that you're trying to buy is sold out. And then uh, it displays the QR code and then it decodes the QR code and it gets the signal back to say that the QR was, uh, the, the export was successful and then it vends. That's it. There's no persistent storage. Richard, the other thing is, uh, you know, the vending machine logic obviously will, uh, we'll use the internal vending machine logic by using Modbus, right? To the, to the yep. normal cashless yep. protocol, right? So yeah. Yep. So the vending machine has its full logic. So, so it, this doesn't need to crap, uh, take uh, account of any state. No, yeah, it's the, the actual uh, XPOP is stateless. Any more questions? Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs> See you. Bye.